Well, good morning. I am still in Montreat, North Carolina. I, uh, I'll be here through tomorrow, so I've been visiting Montreat College. It's beautiful up here. Um, man, I, I want to bring my wife down here next weekend if I can. The leaves are changing so fast that if you don't move, you're going to miss them. But anyway, I'm uh, still working my way through the book of Galatians. Just a lot of time on the road, not a lot of time to do a, a big recording and everything. So I'm just using Facebook Live for now. I'll eventually put it all together so I can complete the series. But last time we found ourselves in Galatians chapter number 5. And, of course, this is really it for the book of Galatians, because once you get in chapter number six, um, chapter number six kind of turns into um, bearing his own burden, communicate, teach good things, be not deceived, God's not mocked. You know, um, I think really chapter five kind of wraps up what Paul is talking about primarily the theme, if you would, of the book. But we'll see. We'll work our way down into it. Lord knows I, I'm i not dogmatic about much these days. <laughs> uh, now, what I've, what I've embraced, what I, what I totally, you know, um, I'm pretty dogmatic about um, mid-acts dispensational at this point. I just, uh, um, you know, it took a while for me to get my mind around it. It took a while to check the boxes. You know, it took a while for me to make sure that you know, this aligns with, uh, with, with the clear interpretation of the scriptures. And then I think for me, being able to go back and see guys that lived years ago embracing this, uh, like, you know, we've, I've talked about the Paulicians, you know, E.W. Bullinger, um, you know, guys like that, sir, um, what's his name? Robert Anderson, you know, guys that, you know, this is not anything new. This isn't something we just pulled out of our hat. It was around, but it was abandoned um, for the modern day dispensationalism that we see today in mainline churches. Um, so Galatians chapter five, uh, we got down to verse number 19. So let me back up here. Um <clears throat> Just to, for context, this I say then in verse 16, Galatians 5, 16, I say then walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That makes sense. <laughs> for the flesh, guess what? It's fighting against the spirit and the spirit's fighting against the flesh. And these two, they're contrary to one another. So you cannot do the things that you would. But if you be led of the spirit, you're not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are, now this is what we talked about last time there in verse number 18 um, when he says there um, you know Paul's solution to the liberty issue um, comes as a result of walking in the spirit if you walk in the spirit you're not going to fulfill the lust of the flesh in other words the flesh will never do something spiritual the flesh the, the spirit will never do something fleshly and when it comes to liberty we need to first ask ourselves if what we're wanting to do is it a work of the flesh or is it a work of the spirit? And of course we follow the spirit. Um, and then he says the end of verse 17 there, so that you cannot do the things that you would. In other words, if you spend your life walking in the spirit, you're not going to have time to fulfill the needs of the flesh or the desires of the flesh. You know, my grandma used to say when I was a kid that mind, an idle mind is the devil's playhouse. <laughs> <laughs> that's not scriptural, but it's a good principle. Um, you know, I, I, I believe if we spend our lives intentionally walking in the Spirit, doing what God would have us to do, we're not going to have time to do the bidding of the devil. Uh, I believe that it's when we as believers, I believe when we as believers begin to struggle, it's when we we stop fighting the fight, when we drop our spiritual swords, if you will, and start thinking in the flesh. Um, <clears throat> so Paul, Paul is basically saying, if you want to stay in the game, um, you don't have time for the flesh. 
Um, so then Paul begins to list the things that the flesh produces in our lives, if we allow it to. In verse 19, teen, for the works of the flesh are manifest. Which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresy, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like of the which I tell you before, as I've also told you in time past, that they which do these things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, he says that these things are the work of the flesh. So if you see somebody or you fall into adultery, it's because you're not walking in the spirit. <laughs> if you fall into fornication or uncleanness or lasciviousness or wrath or strife or sedition, or you're starting to envy uh, it's because you're not walking in the spirit. You're walking in the flesh. His point is that these things should not be what a saved person is involved in because they would be walking in the spirit and they wouldn't have time for it. Yes, these are the things that our fleshly nature naturally wants to do. Um, but if we stay in the spirit, we will not be drawn to these things. Um Notice at the end of verse 21 when he says that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. <clears throat> Seems strange at first glance. And I spent a lot of time on this um, because believe me, the kingdom of God as far as I'm concerned is not for the body of Christ. It's for the Jewish nation. So, but we need to remember that throughout this letter he has been speaking to both kingdom Jews and, I mean, particularly shunning the Judaizers and Gentiles. So he's been, he's been speaking to kingdom Jews and Gentiles. Again, <clears throat> it comes down to a pronoun thing for me. Like I've said in the past, it's not enough to just say, you know, we need to abide by the Pauline epistles. I mean, that's easy. You know, if it's, if it's taught by Paul, you know, in the Pauline epistles, Romans through Philemon, then that's the body of Christ. Yeah, but not Paul, Paul is not always speaking to or about the body of Christ. He's also addressing kingdom Jews quite a bit. And the only way you can tell when he's addressing these guys is paying attention to the per personal pronouns. Because remember, there are kingdom Jews here in Galatia. And there's Gentiles <clears throat> here in Galatia. Um, <clears throat> and there are... Um, you know, uh, grace, uh, Jews here in Galatia, you know? So, um, again, it's a pronoun thing, but he switches from ye Galatian Gentiles in verse 18 to they Jews, particularly the Judaizers in verse number 19, because in verse number 18, but if ye be led of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. So he's speaking to Galatian Gentiles there. And then in verse 19, he says, Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, um, adultery. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, which are adultery, fornication, and cleanness, idolatry, witchcraft, envyings, Verse 21, drunkenness, revelings, and such like, of which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Um, in my opinion, if you take it or leave it, you take it or leave it, <laughs> is that the kingdom will still valid offer at this time. Understand, just because God raised up Paul doesn't mean the kingdom offer immediately came off the table. I believe the kingdom offer stayed on the table to at least the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Um, <clears throat> and this letter was written around 53 to 57 AD. Uh, so I believe Paul is speaking of um, the kingdom Jews there. When he goes from the ye to the they, I believe that he's making a transition there to the kingdom Jews. Um, Paul always spoke to the Jew first and then to the Greek. Uh, you know, Romans 1 16 says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God's salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first 
and also to the Greeks. So Paul <clears throat> always addressed uh, the Jews. And the only way you can tell that in a paragraph or a letter is paying attention to the pronouns. So I believe, you know, when he speaks of that kingdom of God there, uh, he, he's, he's speaking to the Jews there. He's speaking to the kingdom Jews there. And you can see that in the pronoun usage there. Now, you're certainly welcome to another opinion. <laughs> God bless you. Um, and then, of course, he takes a turn in verse 22. Uh, and he says, but the fruit of the Spirit. In other words, if you're walking in the Spirit, this is the thing you're going to do. You're, the Spirit is love and joy and peace and long-suffering and gentleness and goodness and, and faith and meekness and temperance. Against such there is no law. So now he moves to a list of things that the Spirit produces in our lives if we're walking in the Spirit. Again, his point is that if they would actively walk in these things, they would not be tempted to walk in the works of the flesh that was listed in the previous verses. Why? Because you cannot do both at the same time. So, <laughs> well, God bless you guys. Hope you have a great day. And um, um, I'll wake up here tomorrow morning. So we'll get down into verse 24 and 25. God bless you. Hope you have a good day. Remember, God loves you. He wants the best for you. He's working all things out for your good.